Okay, um, so I'm going to be presenting the case for physical activity, and uh, you're going to be the judge and jury, because physical activity or exercise is often maligned. Uh, it's definitely underrepresented. Um, we, and we don't appreciate the, the power of physical activity. So I'm going to be presenting my case for physical activity. So what do I do? I'm a movement coach. Uh, I'm a certified personal trainer. And I'm also a nutritionist. This is one of my clients, a 12-week transformation, uh, which was diet and movement-based. Uh, here is me conducting one of my primal play sessions. You may recognize my play partners here. I've got Jimmy Moore uh, and also Ben Greenfield. And we're doing a, a 2v1 demonstration of, of strength. And I kind of held my, my own there. And I traveled the world evangelizing about the power of play, the power of movement, the enjoyment of movement, which many of us are, are lacking. I'm also an author. This is my first published book, Paleo Fitness. Um, so I wanted to present uh, a way of incorporating movements that we were designed to do, that nature uh, decided was best for us, best for survival, best for humanity at large. That was paleo fitness. My second book was a lifestyle book around the paleo lifestyle, paleo from A to Z. It's a lifestyle encyclopedia covering all the tips and tricks to live a healthier lifestyle. Uh, my most recent book is a seven day introduction to paleo fitness. And uh, my latest book, The Importance of Play, is a free download, uh, which you can access on my blog, Primal play.com. So, um, Jamie spoke about the issues with dairy and uh, I myself am also a paleo advocate so I don't consume dairy. So why shouldn't we eat cheese? Is it because of the milk proteins? Is it because of the, the, the remaining aspects of, of lactose? Well actually, this is why. Cheese is associated <laughs> with death by being strangled by your bread sheets. <laughs> and take this seriously, guys, because one, I've verified my sources. One, it's the USDA has been consulted. And secondly, the CDC. It's over a 10-year period. Uh, and you can say it's a, it's a pretty <laughs> graphic illustration as to why we shouldn't eat cheese. Cheese consumption goes up. Deaths by strangulation of your bedclothes go up, okay? Um, what about this? Nicolas Cage and movie appearances. Well, did you know that you're more likely to drown in a swimming pool if you watch Nicolas Cage movies? Again, this is over a 10-year period. Um, <laughs> so over a 10-year period, and uh, the data is actually true. So I actually source this data. You can double check this. You can go to IMDB <laughs> and the CDC. Um, and what, probably what's important here is that it's very easy to misrepresent data. Uh, I can present whatever I want here, but it's really for you to validate what I present. So a question, what do these guys have in common? Um, if you've seen this presentation before, please don't answer the question, but what do these guys have in common? Usain Bolt, myself, uh, so Chris Hoy, who's, who won five Olympic golds, and LeBron James. What do they all have in common? What do those numbers represent? Any ideas? Athletic. Something. Athletic something. That's a great answer, but not correct. <laughs> Any, anyone else? <laughs> and survived uh, <laughs> death by drowning. Um, so, actually... Uh, this is their BMI score. So what's interesting here is that Usain Bolt, myself, Sir Chris Soyne, and LeBron James are all overweight based on their BMI. Um, some of us realize that BMI is not the best indicator of body fat percentage. Um, but often when we're presented with obesity stats, that's what we, we look to. So I'm overweight, guys. I think to I'll let you know that's the case. Um, so body mass index is an estimate of the proportion of fat that you have based on your height and weight. 
These are the overweight and obesity stats based on BMI in the US. Um, we all know we have an obesity problem. It isn't just local, localized to the US. Uh, it's the same in, in the UK and Europe, uh, as well as in the developing world. And we kind of know BMI has very little to do with the individual. So we have Mo Farah, who won the 5,000, 10,000 meters uh, gold in Rio. The, the Rock, Dwayne Johnson. What do you reckon their BMI scores are? So for Mo Farah, what would you reckon? 30. 30. For, 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 for Mo Farah? 24, like 20, and for what about for Dwayne Johnson? About 30? Okay, so Mo Farah actually has a healthy BMI. Um, it's up for you to decide if that's, you believe that's to be the case or not. Um, and The Rock is obese, morbidly obese, based on his BMI, okay? So everything you've read about the obesity epidemic pretty much relies on BMI. The problems are you can't distinguish between fat and lean mass, your gender, your age. Um, if you have a BMI of 25, you can actually have a body fat percentage between 14% and 35. Okay? Um, and there was a study a few years ago looking at 3 million adults who were in the overweight category who had a lower risk of death. So just being overweight based on BMI doesn't really mean much. And did you know in 1998 that the BMI category was changed overnight and about 30 million adults became overweight in one day? Okay. <laughs> um, so what about obesity? The amount of times I've heard exercise doesn't help with obesity. Um, it's 80% diet, 20% physical activity maybe. Abs are made in the kitchen. Exercise has nothing to do with the you know, obesity epidemic. Um, and when I look for evidence for this 80-20 rule, where does it come from? I haven't seen any evidence presented of this Pareto ratio as to how your lifestyle based on diet and physical activity manifests itself in terms of body fat. But there is evidence, if you look at the first, uh, the diet versus exercise, if you look at the evidence, and one of the reasons why people say exercise doesn't work is because often you're comparing a 500 calorie diet with a 20 to 30 minute exercise regimen. So you're starving yourself, and then somebody's on a treadmill for 30 minutes, and then they say, oh look, this person is starving themselves, actually has a better job of losing weight than the person who's exercising for 30 minutes. Well, surprise, surprise, no wonder that's, that's the case. But if you delve deep into the evidence, if you increase aerobic activity, there's a reduction in visceral fat, fat around the middle. Um, resistance training can actually increase your body weight. An increase in BMI, but a reduction in fat around the middle. Resistance training can increase fat-free mass. Your basal metabolic rate would increase. Your visceral fat would decrease. And the best com combination for long-term success is a combination of diet and exercise. There's a systematic review, 43 randomized controlled trials, and the upshot of this is that an increase in physical activity, especially high-intensity protocols, can increase weight loss, can decrease body fat, can decrease visceral fat. And same in children. Um, it doesn't take very much, but unfortunately children aren't doing very much, to see evidence of fat loss and body composition change in children who are actually physically active. What about reducing blood pressure? Blood pressure, 9% of all premature deaths are believed to be based on hypertension. Single biggest killer, apparently. Um, exercise does help in reducing hypertension. In the short term, there's an increase in blood pressure, but in the longer term, chronic change, there's a reduction in blood pressure. And uh, those who undertake physical activity have a 50% decrease in hypertension. What about inflammation? Oftentimes we're told food is the best way to decrease inflammation. The markers we look at like CRP, for example, um, we can see if we eat 
uh, anti-inflammatory diet, if we eat a healthier diet, we can see these markers improving. Um, but exercise, in the short term, is like to inc uh, increase inflammation. And that manifests itself in DOMS, delayed onset of muscle soreness. You do a workout, you feel sore, you feel inflamed, but that process actually reduces inflammation in the long term. So the signaling that occurs, the myokines that are released, actually send signals to the heart, to the liver, and to other tissues around the body, which reduces systemic inflammation. Um, so not many people are aware of the impact of physical activity, especially resistance training, when it comes to chronic, reducing chronic inflammation. What about the gut microbiome? Again, it's often seen as a way to improve your diet, to take probiotics, reduce uh, antibiotic exposure, fermented foods. But physical activity actually affects the gut microbiome as well. Uh, some very interesting research looking at rugby players and the rugby players who were the fittest within a, a squad um, had more diverse microbiome. And the assumption was that maybe those players had a better diet. Maybe they had better nutrition. And that's what you were seeing being represented. So they had a, a control group, same nutrition, and they just increased the amount of physical activity, looking at VO2 max in particular. And they found that those with a higher VO2 max within that population had greater diversity of uh, gut flora. And it was a 20% difference in variation based on VO2 max alone. So even with the same diet, the same age, the same uh, other health factors, physical activity was an independent factor for increase in gut microbiome. Um, and one of the things that I like to, to feel definitely makes a difference is soil-based organisms. So if you're outside and you're getting your hands dirty, you're more likely to be taking on board good uh, bacteria. What about stress? We all know that stress is a great way, great way uh, or exercise is a great way to reduce stress. Um, in the short term, once again, there's likely to be increased stress to the system. That's how the body adapts to exercise. It only adapts when you apply an increase in intensity that the body says, hold on a second, what do I need to do to overcome and adapt to this stressor? But in the long term, once the body adapts to that stressor, chronic inflammation, chronic stress reduces, and the feel-good hormones uh, that occur through exercise will benefit us. So that's why stress and anxiety and the like reduce with physical activity. What about mood and the feel-good hormones? We all know about the endorphin rush. Uh, endorphins, as you know, are a natural pain reliever. So sometimes when you see people in pain, <sighs> and they go for their run, and they're in lots of pain, and they finish their run, they feel great because the body floods their system with endorphins, and that's one of the benefits of physical activity, but also serotonin, dopamine, the reward uh, neurotransmitter, are all increased based on your experience of physical activity. And if you exercise within a group setting, and you actually have some tactile contact with your play partners, then oxytocin is also the kind of hug hormone, the love hormone, the cuddle hormone is also uh, released. So with the right type of activity, you can actually feel better immediately, not just at the end of your physical activity. What about sleep, sleep quality? So exercise can help you sleep better at night. If you're physically inactive, you're more likely to have insomnia and other sleep disorders. Physical activity during the day stimulates restorative sleep at night. Serotonin is released with physical activity, so you're more likely to have a proper uh, melatonin release at night. What about blood glucose control? So again, most of us are aware of how we can uh, control our carbohydrate intake to manage glucose homeostasis, and insulin being one of the prime drivers, and let's minimize insulin secretion. But did you know that physical activity exercise doesn't require insulin to remove blood glucose. So GLUT4, the transporter, uh, can actually 
force blood glucose into the cell without using insulin as long as there's muscle contraction. So if you have significant muscle contraction through resistance training, not just aerobic activity, through resistance training, you don't need insulin. And given about 75 to 80 percent of uh, blood glucose, the sink of that is muscle tissue, it's extremely important. Only about 5 percent is sent to adipose tissue. Okay? The majority of it is sent to muscle tissue if you're moving, if there is uh, muscle contraction. So you can see here that resistance training increases insulin, 70, uh, insulin sensitivity for about 48 to 72 hours post-activity. You're less likely to be type 2 diabetic, type 2 diabetic, and you're more likely to be metabolic, suffer metabolic syndrome if you're sedentary. What about blood lipids? Cardiovascular risk profile. So, aerobic activity and resistance training uh, is likely to improve your HDLC. You like to have less H uh, LDLC, uh, lower triglycerides, lipoprotein A reduction. Um, LDLC particle size tends to increase and is less atherogenic. LDLP count is reduced with physical activity, so you have less cardiovascular risk. Other markers like homocysteine is also reduced as well. Uh, in the short term, you can have an increase in homocysteine from short to, uh, aerobic activity. But again, in the longer term, there's a reduction in these markers. Cognitive function and brain health. For kids, improvement in academic performance. Uh, for those in the middle ages, if you're active as kids, as teenagers, you're more likely to maintain your cognitive function in your middle ages. And as we become older adults, there are benefits for, from physical activity based on B, D, and F. So one of the only growth factors available to us in the brain is based on movement, not on the foods we consume, not based on brain training, but through movement. Neurogenesis occurs through movement, especially movement you haven't done before, and which is one of the reasons why dancing and improvisation is very beneficial for older adults. If you perform the same physical activity you did as a kid, as an adult, into older adults, the brain doesn't respond as well. You have to mix things up. Your movement has to become multidimensional, multiplane. Okay, you have to be thinking on your feet. That's where movement becomes uh, the most potent and powerful. So I'll introduce you to my first client, who was one of the 68% of individuals who was likely to suffer from chronic lifestyle disease. So that 68% is the figure globally that all of us of that 68% are suffering from. Cancer, type 2 diabetes, uh, strokes, heart disease. And this client of mine was hypertensive, they're pre-diabetic, they were overfat, they had a poor lipid profile, they were anemic, they were suffering from seborrheic dermatitis. The resolution, the solution offered to them was a prescription uh, cocktail of prescription medication. The good news is, I was my first client. <laughs> In a very short space of time, uh, I was no longer hypertensive, no longer anemic, was no longer pre-diabetic. Uh, my my uh, blood glucose levels were optimal. I was no longer hypertensive. I was no longer anemic. I was no longer suffering from seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, and that was in three short months. So a very short intervention of changing my diet and lifestyle for me to say, thank goodness, no medication. But I kind of lie. There was a medicine involved. And that medicine, or part of that medicine, was physical activity. It worked for me. But what are the benefits for the general population? A 50% reduction in all causes of death. 50%. Pretty much any condition you can think of, there's a 50% reduction in that condition if you're physically active. Pretty significant. 50% uh, reduction for specific cause mortality, cardiovascular risk and mortality risk is reduced by half. There's improvements in mental health, reduction in stroke of 27%, reduction in hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome, there's reduction in cancers, everything from bowel cancer to lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, 
quality of life indicators like osteoporotic fractures, um, less risk of falling, and um, you're more likely to have an independent life as we age. So how much are we supposed to be doing? Pretty much every single government agency around the world recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity for adults. 150 minutes. 30 minutes a day, five days a week. But also, which people often tend to miss out, it also recommends two days of resistance training per week. Two days. And if you're an older adult, over 65, there isn't a reduction in that prescription. You should still partake in 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity, plus two days of resistance training, plus some additional training, balance training, fall preventions, uh, flexibility training. That's how much we should be partaking in. And for kids under five, there should be at least three hours a day of physical activity, moderate to vigorous intensity activity a day. So many kids are not getting that prescription <laughs> right about now. That's for sure. So um, people are often telling me that, yeah, I, I do 30 minutes a day. I, I meet the recommendations. You know, I walk up the stairs every now and again. Um, I, you know, I go to the gym three times a week. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sedentary. Um, people not, don't realize that being sedentary is not meeting that 150 minutes a week of, of moderate intensity activity. You're sedentary if you don't meet those recommendations. If you're not doing two days of resistance training, you're sedentary, you're physically inactive. That's what it means. And that's the starting point. That's not the end point. That's the beginning of changing your life through movement. And um, when you look at the research, this is what UK adults and American adults report. 35% um, of UK adults meet the recommendations. 21% of US adults meet the recommendations. But when they're wearing an accelerometer, when they're actually telling the truth, it's 5% of adults meet the recommendations. And then there are those telling us that physical activity has no bearing on the overweight and obesity epidemic because we're doing just as much as we did a generation ago. I, I don't believe that to be the case. 5% of adults, 8% of children are meeting the recommendations. We're not doing a great job. And when you compare children of yesteryear um, compared to today, and you can see the difference in performance, you know, running a mile or, you know, the differences between walking or biking to school in the present day, but probably the most alarming one, have a look at the anxiety row here. <laughs> so today, you're three times more likely to be admitted to hospital falling out of a bed than you are falling out of a tree. Yeah, and that's the same in the, in the UK as well. So these come from the National Statistics uh, and CDC. <laughs> so you can, you can actually look up those, those, uh, those stats. But it's quite alarming that kids can't even fall out of bed safely now because just, they've just lost all ability to, to deal with kind of rough and tumble. It's quite, it's quite alarming. Um, we don't have any unstructured play anymore. We're getting our kids to be coached in soccer and other sports because we believe they'll, be, they'll benefit. But they're just not getting time to free roam, to be free range kids, as a lot, of us, a lot of us did when we were kids. So let's just look at physical activity alone. This is a great study looking at identical twins being tracked from 16 to 36 years old. And uh, for the last three years of, their, of that 36, 33 to 36 years old, one twin became physically inactive for three years, okay? And pretty much their upbringing, their education, their career paths were identical, they had similar diets. But the difference between encountering a sedentary lifestyle for three years meant that they had an increase in body fat, uh, they had an increased risk of cardiovascular events, they had less glucose, uh, glucose homeostasis, they increased their body fat percentage, and they had a decrease in gray matter in the brain. Just three years of living a sedentary lifestyle in comparison to their genetically identical twin. So this is the wellness activity curve. Um, I do believe movement is medicine, um, but we can do too much. There is a sweet spot, and that sweet spot is around 300 to 450 minutes a week of varied activities, 
not just weight training, not just running, not just doing flexibility training, but a composite of every single movement uh, component available to us. Crawling, climbing, jumping, sprinting, lifting, carrying. These are the movement capabilities that we should be partaking in to have a wholesome and holistic movement approach. So 150 minutes is the minimum to take us from sedentary lifestyle to a physically active one. Uh, once you go past 450 minutes, it can be detrimental for longevity, for life expectancy. You're more likely to have musculoskeletal issues and, and, uh, and injuries. You're more likely to have chronic inflammation. Uh, you're more likely to get addicted to exercise because you know uh, dopamine response is exactly the same as having your Twinkie. <laughs> the brain lights up when you're exercising. Okay, not many people tell us not to exercise though, but it can become addictive, okay, if you do too much. But our environment is telling us not to move. This is a sign in, the, in Covent Garden in London on the metro station. Do not walk because it's dangerous. Do not walk because you may have an issue climbing stairs. And these type of signs, I'm seeing them everywhere. Um, when I come off the, when I arrive in the US, and after a few meters, I see those travelators that are available where you can, or walking walkways, I think they call them, um, even though many people don't walk on them. But um, yeah, you see these walking walkways and people have been on the plane for like 12 hours, nine hours, and they can't wait to get onto this travelator um, <laughs> because of course, they've just been sitting on the plane for, for nine hours, or they can't wait to get into a wheelchair to be taken to baggage claim for somebody, to, for a porter to carry their bags for them, even if they're more than capable of doing so. So we're bombarded with all of these signals telling us not to move. But what if you love exercise? Muhammad Ali, I mean, he loved to train, didn't he? Uh, not according to this quote. He hated every single minute of training. But he did it because he knew for him to be champion of the world, he had to train, he had to do more than his competitor. But he hated it. He hated exercise, and I want to confess to you all today, I hate exercise too. I'm pretty honest about it. I don't love exercise. I love movement, but I don't love exercise because exercise is an artificial component necessary in the 21st century. And we hate it because we resist burning calories. We want to conserve energy. We want to sit on the couch and do nothing. That's what we want to do. That's what evolution tells us to do. <laughs> so what does fitness tell us? Fitness tells us no pain, no gain. If it's not hurting, it's not working. My warm-up is your workout. Arnold is telling us right there how uncomfortable it is <laughs> for him to be Mr. Olympia, okay? He's working hard, he's playing hard. Pain to him is weakness leaving the body. Those are the messages we get from fitness. You go to Instagram and those fitspirational images are telling us how amazing it is living this lifestyle and they're pretty much in pain all of the time. That's not the sort of world I want to live in, okay? Um, here's a workout class devised in London, and it had a lot of press, because they basically said, if you do this workout, you might die. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm, this, is no word of, this is no joke. This workout was called Flatline, and they had a cardiologist on standby, they had paramedics on standby, and you had to sign a death waiver to complete this 30 minute workout, okay? And they had a lot of people signing up to this workout to see if they could survive, okay? It was all over the press in the UK and I saw it elsewhere in, in the US and we were attracted to this challenge of like, maybe I'll die if I do this 30 minute workout, but won't it be great? Imagine my testimonials at my funeral. He died doing a workout. How dedicated was he to his craft, okay? Something's not right when it comes to fitness. So, here's something I made. It's a trailer to a movie never made, and it's entitled Why Exercise is Boring. More volume. So exercise, we know exercise can be boring. Um, often, many of us have been in this position, right? But there was a time when movement was about being carefree. It was about having fun and enjoyment. We weren't exercising, we were moving. And it's about reawakening your inner child. 
This is one of my primer play classes. People are laughing. They're smiling. They're having a good time. And we all should reclaim the enjoyment of movement. That's what we should be doing. We should be having fun. We should be creative. We should be putting the fun back into movement. Why play with dumbbells and I can play with somebody who's pretty smart? <laughs> So these are adults playing as if they were kids. And I believe play is the antidote to a sedentary lifestyle. And kids of all ages, from 4 to 94, can partake in tribal play. So, I believe. Primal play is one way to ensure we have fun when it comes to movement. So this is one of my programs that I devised called the Animal Moves Challenge, getting us to experience what it's like to train like an animal, but to move like a human. Humans are pretty poor when it comes to movement capability. Do you know why? Why are humans poor when it comes to movement capability? What do you reckon the answer is? Why? Anyone? Because we're bipedal? I mean, that's pretty great for walking, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so why are we limited when it comes to movement? It's because we're just not very good at anything at all. We can't jump as far as a kangaroo. We can't sprint very fast when you compare us to a cheetah. Okay? Uh, we can't climb like a bonobo. Um, and ants can carry 10 times their body weight, but we feel great when we can carry two times our body weight. Do you know what I mean? So when we compare ourselves to the animal kingdom, we're pretty poor. But what gives us our capability is the fact that we are movement generalists. We can do all of those things. We can climb, we can swim, we can jump, we can sprint, we can run long distances. That's why we are masters of movement. But unfortunately, most of us don't partake in that. So anyway, this is one of my uh, movement challenges, 30 days of becoming leaner, stronger, and healthier. And... Uh, here are five ways to introduce more fun into fitness. Music is one of the best ways of improving your experience with movement. Um, one is a distraction, <laughs> um, but secondly, there's lots of evidence that you actually work out harder listening to music. And the, um, the research says that it's something to do with the rhythmic response. The body responds to rhythm and timing. And uh, from the earliest, from the dawn of time, we responded to that, those type of signals. So music is a very good way to improve our uh, response to, to fitness. Um, but also visualization and thinking positively. So if I'm doing this, <laughs> oh, why am I doing this? I really hate this. Um, I've got to pretend I'm enjoying this, but I can't. You know, that's how we feel. Our, our physiology tells us that this, there's something not quite right about this. But if I'm upright, a bit of smile on my face, or I'm actually playing a game, hey, let's play, let's play, okay? That's engaging, that's fun, okay? That experience is beneficial to us. Uh, heading outdoors. If you do the same exercise indoors as opposed to outdoors, you burn 23% more calories just by stepping outdoors, performing the same activity. You burn 13% more body fat based on temperature regulation, based on increased wind resistance. Uh, seeing the color green, seeing nature, being biophilic, filiacs, okay? We are in tune with nature. Just being in touch with nature improves the responsiveness of exercise. So get outside, don't just stay in the gym. And finally, find a workout partner or community. We're social creatures, we're part of a tribe. Find your tribe. And in closing, physical inactivity can be detrimental to health. So before you begin a program of living a sedentary lifestyle, always consult with your doctor. Okay? Especially if you have been previously active or you have some sort of condition that would benefit from <laughs> being physically active.
If you'd like to contact me, here's my email address, my social uh, media assets. Let's all stand, because you know sitting is the new smoking. Uh, okay. Darren, we're getting very, sh uh, Darren, we're very short for time. Okay. Can we do like a one or two minute thing Oh, yeah, here? that's perfect. Because we've got a whole bunch of people outside waiting okay. for... Okay, uh, all right. Uh, so um, what I'd like you to do is to partner them up so we, we don't have much space. Can I have... Uh, Jamie, Jamie can... Uh, Jamie can be my... <laughs> okay, so what I want you to do is to stand opposite your partner, okay, and just make sure you can touch their shoulders. Okay, can you touch my shoulders? Yeah. Okay, so the goal is... You're going to try and tag your partner's shoulder, but you've got to keep your feet in the same place, okay? So you can only, you can bob and weave, you can lean back, okay, but that's all you can do, okay? So get as more, score as many points as you can. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Um, okay. Look, ap apolo apologies, Daryl. We are behind in the other room. Uh, hang uh, now, you're running a fitness class over lunchtime, is yes. that correct? I'm, I'm running one at lunchtime, so if you want to do a little bit more of this, it will be indoors. Thank you very much. And thanks for, thanks for a great talk, and I'm sorry we had to uh, cut you short. We'll try and keep to time more as we go on. In Thank you very meeting. much, everyone. Thank you.